I won't leave you, so. Anyway, it's really lovely to see, be here again with everyone. So anyone that doesn't know me, uh, my name is Chantal Homan and I'm the Service and Quality Manager with the Child Mental Health Services in Southampton. I also, um, as part of my role, oversee the Autism Assessment Service. Um, and in terms of my background, I'm a learning disability nurse by background um, with additional training in child and adolescent mental health. Um, and prior to this role, um, it did a role uh, as a generic kind of CAMS nurse and practitioner, as a nurse prescriber, but also um, started off my career as a specialist nurse for children and people with learning disabilities and additional mental health needs. Um, and a lot of that was around helping parents and carers to think about and manage and respond to the behaviour that quite often um, was what we would see in young people with quite significant levels of distress. So that's me and why I'm here today. So I've got a few slides to take you through, which are very much overview slides, but hopefully with the intention of just kind of generating some discussion and opportunities at the end for any questions, comments, anything like that. And I also know that I'm, I'm booked to have conversations with a few of you, which I'm looking forward to. So always helpful to think about when we're talking about kind of um, challenge behavior, what it is. And these are two definitions that I always come back to. One of them, the first one around culturally abnormal behavior is from a, a really esteemed and well-respected um, clinical psychologist, Eric Emerson. And the other is a joint statement from the Royal College of Psychiatrists and I think speech and language therapist as well. Um, and I think the kind of the reason why I like these is that it talks about obviously the behavior, but more than that, it's about the impact on the behavior for the individual, which is about kind of being denied access to or being unable to um, have involvement in ordinary community facilities is put there. And I think that really is what so commonly happens for our families and our young people, either at school or at home or more broadly is that actually the, the, the behavior, whatever it is, um, is something that gets in the way of a child fully being able to engage in school, in learning, fully, be, fully being able to kind of participate in family life, in friendships and things like that. And it's that knock-on effect that obviously has an impact on child self-esteem, developing mental health, et cetera. And you kind of end up in this um, cycle really. Um, and when we talk about challenging behavior, it's really difficult to say what is a challenge in behavior because my view, and I think probably the view of parents and carers who have worked with many over the years would say, it's really different. What I as a parent might find as a behavior that is really challenging to me might be totally different to the behavior which say the parent next to me might find extremely challenging or the professional or whatever. So, you know, challenge behavior absolutely is about the hitting out behavior, the aggression and things like that. But it can just as much be about the child's refusal to do anything, um, you know, so for, for the child that will just sit down and not move for a good couple of hours, no matter what you do, you're not hurting anybody, but actually that's quite a challenge in itself as a behavior to be able to think about how to manage that safely for everybody, particularly for the middle of the road, which has happened to me before. Um, so in terms of the iceberg, I don't know how many people have seen this before. I'm going to make my screen bigger because I'm not sure if everybody's able to see this. Let's slide shake on. There it is. Okay. So, um, in terms of the iceberg, we often talk about the iceberg in terms of behaviour. So, I think probably what we'd all agree to and sign up with, if we think about our own behaviour for a moment, is that what you see or hear us doing is more often than not the tip and the indicator of what is happening inside for us. So um, for example, I'm happy to give a, a personal example. My husband, I always know when he's hungry because he gets really stroppy on the top. So what I see is just a bit of a stroppy husband. And what I know is happening underneath that in terms of kind of, you know, his physical sensations is, is hunger and low blood sugar within that. Um, and I guess if you, you know, if you took a moment to just sort of be a bit mindful about your own needs and really think about maybe how you uh, present 
when there is something happening underneath the surface for you we do present differently people probably know there's something going on people might find our behaviors our reactions our expressions different or an indication of something going on the difference being of course is that we have learned over time and we also have the level of executive functioning to be able to kind of learn over time how to deal with that how to best manage that and how to develop skills for communication, getting our needs met, being independent in that way need to be. So that whilst you may see a little bit of a change in behavior for a period of time, it's not really a change in behavior that stays, nor is it likely to be you know, a change in behavior that um, is sustained in that sense and unable to uh, have a need beneath it that's been met. So, once we kind of get our head around the AB, the, the iceberg, we can start thinking about how we apply that into understanding why a child or a young person is behaving in the way that we do, they do. And we call that the ABC, um, otherwise known within kind of psychological theories and formulations as a functional analysis. So uh, broken down, basically meaning what is the function of the person's, be person's behavior? And we're going to analyze the behavior to be able to understand that. Um, and it is for something that is so powerful and such a core element of any understanding of behavior or any start in a process to changing behavior it is often the most simplest tool within the whole thing. And it is basically, you know, you can write out a form at home, on your computer, what have you. Um, and as long as you've got these three columns as the core columns, you're doing all right. And that is the antecedent. So that is exactly what happens prior to a behavior. And it will be something that triggers the behavior. And now what we often hear is, well, there was nothing. They just went kind of like, you know, naught to 10 in the split second. What I would say to you is that was, there is always something, always, whether it's something that we didn't see, whether it takes us a little bit of time to work out, but there will always be something that happens. And this is why this is so important. So the behavior, and, and that's about being as specific as possible with it. Because when we talk about challenge behavior, what I will often go back and say, okay, so what do they actually do? What do they actually say? Why is that challenging to you? Because challenge behavior can often be described as, oh, they had a massive meltdown or a huge tantrum, or um, you know, they were just so dysregulated. Now, all of those things do mean something, but they don't really help us to identify for this child, you know, what, what is their behavior for them? How do we describe that? Do they hit? Do they kick? Do they bite? Do they throw things? Do they slam doors? Do they swear? Do they sit down and refuse to move? What is the behavior that is challenging there? And then we know what we're targeting, really. And then the consequences, which is exactly that, really. It is what happens immediately after the behavior. Um, and it is that consequence that is the, the kind of deciding factor really in the likelihood of reoccurrence as I put there because behavior serves a function and if that function and need is not met through the consequence then that behavior will change and we will all find alternative ways of having our, our needs met. The other bits that we would add on to an ABC chart would be obviously the date and the time um, and some of the things that we look at around that is, you know, is it always just before school or is it just before dinner? Is there a pattern to the timings? Is there a pattern to the days? Um, and by looking at that, what you might then over see over time is an overall trend and pattern that maybe it's a Saturday afternoon just before swimming that a behavior happens. And what is it about that that we need to understand a bit more sort of thing? So I spoke a little bit then around um, understanding why and that sometimes it's really not that easy to understand or to find the reason as to why. And in terms of kind of reinforcement, so what is it that is driving a behavior and or um, maintaining a behavior? It largely falls into two categories. 
And these can be really confusing because when we talk about positive and negative reinforcement, what immediately comes to our mind as adults and parents and carers is that a child has got either got something that they wanted or that they've been told off in terms of a negative reinforcement. But I need you to wipe that from your mind right now. And I need you to kind of imagine that you've never heard these two phrases before, because I'm gonna give you another way of looking at them. And so when a behavior is being positively reinforced, it means that we're gaining something, okay? And it doesn't have to be a challenging behavior. So um, for example, um, if I, uh, let's just say, uh, I heard this example once, I thought it was brilliant, I thought I must try it. Um, so in the morning, um, the behavior being that you don't get up because if you don't get up, somebody brings you a cup of tea in bed. So that is a positive reinforcement because you're getting something. So the behavior of not getting up in the morning in a, a, a timely fashion is being positively reinforced because you're being given a nice cup of tea. Who wouldn't? And then the negative reinforcement is when something is taken away as a result of your behavior. And this is, a, this is something that we really commonly see within school and within demand avoidance. So the negative reinforcement means that something's been taken away. And so, for example, if a child uh, throws a chair in a classroom, for example, and they are removed from the classroom, that behavior is negatively reinforced because what they have had taken away from them is the demand or the work, say if it's maths, for example, they've been able to remove the maths work. So they've had a negative reinforcer. I'm just gonna stop there because I can't see anybody from, from where I am, but before I move on, does anybody wanna ask any questions around that? No, okay, fine, I will move on. So it's this that we're looking at when we're trying to understand the cause of the challenging behavior. Is somebody getting something or is somebody trying to get away from something? And that helps us to understand what we need to maybe help a child to either do differently or the adults around them to do differently or the environment. Now I put this one in because it just made me really giggle about the child sitting on the couch watching TV. And it's quite a kind of easy one to, to think about. Um, so, the antecedent being, you know, poor little Wilt William sat on the couch watching TV and I can just imagine him now absentmindedly picking his nose. So that, you know, is the behaviour. The consequence being from mum, William, stop doing that. So the function that has been hypothesised and thought about here is a possible function being that actually little William's getting some nice attention from there, even though it seems like negative attention. Sometimes any attention is good attention. So he's getting that positive reinforcement in terms of that addition of um, uh, attention from his mum. But he could also be a secondary uh, reinforcer of, of sensory. You know, he may very well like the feeling of picking his nose. And so that kind of addition of a, of a sensory reinforcer are both positive reinforcers to this that says that William is probably, like many other children, going to carry on picking his nose in that way. OK. So moving on to what do you do about it so you've spent a good bit of time uh completing your abc charts you've been studiously writing things down you've been looking at them you've been scratching your head thinking what on earth happened just before there you've been thinking about the environment the communication all that kind of iceberg of behavior stuff as well and you've got to the point where you're thinking right i'm re i'm ready to sort of do a plan about this the first thing that you're going to need to do is identify which behavior are you going to target? Which behavior is the one that you're going to start with? Because I think for any, any of us, if you ask us to change more than one thing in one go, that becomes quite overwhelming. Um, it becomes quite um, de-skilling. And it also becomes something that we immediately feel like, you know, we're going to fail at. If we don't have a high level of self-esteem and we don't have a huge amount of um, adaptive skills available to us, if you try and take away, you know, two or three 
different behaviours at any one point in time. We're not leaving a child with much in order to um, succeed, if you like. So first and foremost, pick a behaviour. Now you might have to negotiate on this in the first instance. What I wouldn't recommend that you do is you pick the most challenging behaviour that happens the most of the time and might be the hardest to change because that's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of thought. It's going to take a lot of buy-in from the child and a lot of buy-in from people around you. And sometimes, in fact, most of the time, when you're first starting off, my recommendation to you would be to pick this behaviour that you think you can have the most success of changing in the shortest time frame possible. Serves for two things. One is it helps you to increase your confidence that you absolutely can nail this, you know what you're doing, and this stuff works. Two, and perhaps most importantly, it really helps your child or young person to have a sense of self-esteem and a sense of self-confidence and self-belief that they can do this. And also to really start to experience the positive reinforcers that come from doing something differently. So they get that extra motivation and they kind of get that extra desire to do something differently because it feels good ultimately. Um, what I am saying to you though, is that this takes time. If you think about children, young people who develop behaviors that are more challenging or not the behaviors that we desire to see, they've been developing them over a number of years in all honesty. And so if you think that a behavior is becoming ingrained for a couple of years, we need to kind of really respect where the child is coming from for that and give them a chance to, to take the time to be able to change it and allow them to make mistakes and revert back to the behavior as well, because that will happen. So the first thing you're looking at within all of this, and this is, um, so sorry, from, this is from uh, Lavinia. It's the essentially the Lavinia model for um, understanding and changing behavior. And I really like it because I like things that are in boxes. I like things that I can look at and kind of break it down and I can get a plan on a page rather than a huge, great big report that I'm, I'm wading through. And it feels therefore much more accessible for everybody involved. So you're looking at the environment. So in your ABC charts, you're thinking about, okay, so where did that happen? Did that happen in the lounge? Did it happen while we were out? Did it happen whilst trying to get out of the car? Um, you know, what are the things that are happening within a child's environment that is potentially increasing the um, uh, potential for challenging behaviours? That might be noise levels. It might be communication strategies. It may be that a child is really frustrated by their communication and hasn't yet learnt um, alternative ways of communicating in a, in a non-verbal fashion. Um, it may be um, that... You know, it could be, I've had a time where a young person, it turned out that somebody in school was just sitting too close to them, really stressed them out. And then we got this massive explosion. So in terms of kind of getting the physical environment right, we needed to make sure that there was space between this child and another child and they felt safer in that way. Um, and by social environment, we're obviously thinking about who's around. So, you know, sometimes that is quite unavoidable, particularly in really busy classrooms and things like that. But I think it's OK to to recognise that, you know, we all get along with people in different ways. And that sometimes in terms of that social environment, there are characters and characteristics that just don't gel together. And that maybe before we can expect a child to gel with that person, we need to take a step back and kind of help them to manage that from an environmental sort of way before they learn the new skills about how they manage that themselves in a social interaction way. And then the other bit then is once you have an idea about the behavior you want to change, why that behavior is occurring, what that gives you an opportunity to think about is how, what else can that child do rather than behavior to still get that same outcome. So if we take an example of a child being hungry, maybe, um, and yet what we know is that the behavior becomes extremely challenging when they're hungry or thirsty, their blood sugars are a bit low, and we know that they need a snack to kind of help them pick, pick them up and pet them on their way. The new skill that we could teach them is either um, some, some pecs, some pictorial exchange type things so that they can pick up a picture of some food to give us an indication that that's what's going on. Or we can sort of 
um, teach them the independent skills to you know go out to the kitchen themselves and to be able to to get some food and a way that you can kind of break that down for example is making sure that you've got some food accessible food out on the side that a child can you know constantly be be picking up healthy i would say obviously um, to help build up those um, independent skills but it's really really vitally important that whatever new skill you're supporting your child uh, or young person to learn it's a skill that gets them the same outcome as the challenging behavior and that's the bit that can really take a bit of head scratching and thinking about it's all very well me sitting here and talking about it i'm not sitting here saying this is easy by any stretch of the imagination so you know scratch your head have a good think about it talk to friends um, talk to other families get some ideas from there and then the reinforcement bit is again as important as, as the other bits there isn't really any one part of this uh, plan that is more important than the other because if you lose one side of it the whole thing kind of uh, comes comes down but the reinforcement bit as you would imagine is making sure that the individual person gets what it is they want when they use their new skill and that may be that they're not using their new skill for to the utmost maybe they're doing half of it but you recognize that they're trying so you give them what they're after anyway in order to kind of increase their motivation to do it next time for some young children this might be going really over the top with praise and really kind of making a big show of it and exaggerating your facial expression so that they can see and feel and hear just how proud you are of them and what an amazing job they've done and um you know how great that they've tried for others it may be something much, much smaller, much more just like a, a, you know, a little wink and just a kind of little bit of body language that recognizes that, you know, you've seen it, you've noticed it and you think they've done an amazing job. So it might be a little wink or a little um, uh, thumbs up or, or whatever. We don't assume that every child uh, responds to the same reinforcement. For other families, this might be where your reward charts come in, sort of thing, you know, um, you know, I really saw that you did brilliantly with that, I'm going to give you what you wanted, but also you're going to get marble in the pot. And when you've got 10 marbles, you're going to you know, get whatever it is that you're, you're really into right now. Um, so whatever works for your child. And again, this can take some head scratching as well, because what motivates a child one day, as we all know, can really change the next day. So it's kind of helpful to have uh, quite a lot of tools in your in your toolbox to think about what you can pull out of the bag and, and change them around with. Um, examples such as things as uh, what young people might need who need more immediate reinforcement. Um, we've done things like where we've had, you know, the little party bags and kind of pick, pick, pick and mix bags. And, you know, you can go to the pound shop or what have you and just get some uh, little bits to put in as the pick and mix bag. So they get that immediate reinforcer. Um, you can flip that around in terms of teaching a new skill, in terms of kind of learning to wait by um, saying, right, you know, so you're going to have um, you need two marbles to get something from the the bag so on your first go at doing it you're going to get a marble then on your second go look you got a marble and here you go here is your party bag so you can take a little pick and mix so be creative be playful think like a frog out of a box of all the different things that you might be able to to do there and then the reactive strategies now what Lavinia would say is that the reactive strategies really should be no more than 25 percent of your overall plan and clearly the ideal is that we want to be reducing those even further. But this is what you do when the behavior occurs because we're not saying that you can eradicate behavior. Nobody is going to be able to come along and kind of do that for you as you well know. And given that behavior is communication, we would expect there to always be some element of uh, uh, behavior. Sometimes what we're looking for is a behavior that becomes more uh, socially acceptable perhaps and or uh, less risky to either ourselves or themselves or others so this is what you're going to do if and when the behavior occurs and this for children and young people that can access this plan with you and do it with you 
I always think it's really important that we share with them and talk with them about what we're going to do. And we do this in a partnership way. So there's no surprises, really. Reactive strategies can really quickly feel quite punitive to a child. Um, and that's not what we're aiming for here. So the more collaborative we can be about it, the more upfront we can be about the fact that, you know, as the adult around it, I've got a responsibility and a duty to keep you and other people safe. And that's what I'm going to do because you're important to me. And, but I'm really happy and would really like to think with you about when that behavior happens, how can I best help you? Now, obviously that's not going to be, I'm gonna go out of the house and leave you because that's what you want. There's some boundaries around that. But if you have a child or a young person that's able to engage in that with you, then I would really recommend that you do that. But these, again, will be the things that you need to put in place. So it may well be um, that you recognise for your child that when the behaviour happens, you need to step back. I don't mean going out of the house. I mean, if you're upstairs, you go downstairs. If you're in the front room, you go upstairs. That Actually, what your child needs at that point in time is some space. And so you take a step back. The other re reactive strategy might be that you change your tone of voice, you don't shout, you reduce it down, you really think about the tone and you really think about the number of words that you're using because a child in that um, high expressed emotion state isn't really listening to words and the more that we give them in terms of that sensory overload of communi verbal communication, the more aroused um, uh, they can be and that doesn't um, help anyone. It might be so for some young children, children, young people who um, would be quite impulsive and easily distracted that you can really um, redirect them and distract them out of the behaviour with something. I used to have a young person that um, used to love it. So whenever they started escalating, we would say, oh, my goodness, there's a flying squirrel again. And it was for whatever reason, it was enough to just make them stop and genuinely go and look outside for a flying squirrel. So whatever. And again, a bit like the reinforcement, have quite a few in your toolbox because what works one day isn't going to work the next day. And this is the sort of thing where you don't really have the time to think about it. So you kind of got to be uh, pre-planned and, and pre-aware. Before I move on, um, any questions from anyone on that? No. OK, so final few words for me in this whistle stop tour of um, assessing and was managing and planning for challenge and behaviour is that intermittent reinforcement is really powerful. Now, of course, we are all going to slip. We're not perfect. We're human. Um, you know, we have good days. We have bad days. But before you take that thought that says, Oh, I'm just going to give in to you in this once. Stop yourself and just think, is the behavior you're giving into the behavior that you're wanting to change? If it is, then the intermittent reinforcements that you do can often be more powerful than the constant giving in, if you like. So if I give you an example, you know, the child that, um, if we think about sort of sleep, and maybe for any parents and carers who are trying to work on their son or daughter kind of working in their own bed at night, staying in their own bed at night, you know, your, your basic kind of sleep hygiene pattern around that would be that every time the child comes into your room, you really calmly, very quietly get them up and gently redirect them back to their room. And you might have to do that 5, 10, 15 times a night for a long time, and it can be really tiring. Um, however, on maybe the fifth night after the fourth time of them coming in, you're so tired, you just think, oh, just get in, just get into bed and leave it. What the child has learned, not consciously, but learned is that, right, it takes five nights, four goes for me to get this. So next time I'm going to keep it up, five nights, four goes, and if I don't get it, then I'll get it for six nights and probably on the sixth night on the third go, I'll get it. Does that make sense? Um, so it's just, you know, we're all human. I'm not going to say we don't do it. Of course we do. But just when you catch yourself going, oh, I'm just can give in this once, make that a second thought around it. OK. And do one behavior at a time and one 
teaching new skill at a time for your sake and for your child's sake. Doing too much doesn't help anybody. It becomes overwhelming, it becomes overloading, and we're all more likely to get really frustrated with it, really confused by it and thinking, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing at this point in time for which behavior. Um, remember that this takes time. Um, it takes a lot of time. We've just said, you know, a child has been developing these behaviors for years. It's not going to change overnight. And there was a really, really good, helpful analogy given to me the other day from one of my colleagues in the jigsaw team said, you know, very often we don't realize it's a challenging behavior until it's got so challenging that it becomes risky. And that's because it develops so slowly over time that it just becomes part of your norm and you naturally adapt and you naturally do something differently and you naturally find your ways around it until one day you kind of wake up and you think, oh my goodness, I just don't know how to do it anymore. And so if you think about it in that analogy, and then you think how you backtrack from that to help your child to do something differently, it's a big ask for them. It's an ask that they can absolutely do with your support, encouragement and input, but it is um, a big ask. Um, consistency across environments. Obviously, you know, the more consistent we are, the, the more chance we give a child to, to learn and apply the skills in different environments. And then reevaluate progress with your ABC charts. Um, and that will be either to just kind of review, do something differently, think, hang on a minute, that's not working, the needs have changed. Or it will be to review and go, my goodness me, look at this six months ago, look what was happening. We've just done it again and compared the two. And the, you know, the difference is amazing. Um, I think that's, well, it's not all. I could honestly go on about this subject for days and years. It's a subject I feel really passionate about, um, but I've tried to kind of condense it down into something that is hopefully something you can take away and be bite-sized and, and digestible, but also something that you can take away, have a go at. And if you wanted to come and talk to us sort of later at a drop-in clinics to pick up on bits and, you know, it'd be our pleasure to do so as well.